<laughs> this is going to be a struggle, so. Uh, Can you see the record button? <laughs> well, you know, I, oh, I actually go. think it, I actually think it might be recording right now. It but, says it's recording. Okay, yeah. thank you. So this webinar here is uh, Inclusive Language in the Remote Learning Environment with Dr. Jenna Andrews, and you don't need to be reminded of the day and time, <laughs> or maybe you do, because I heard that uh, the quarantine and and being homebound is actually causing people to have some sort of a, a memory loss of, of uh, even what day of the week it is. So maybe you do need to be reminded. So if you do, it is Thursday, June 11th, around 4 p.m. Eastern time. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to join the AMATIC Midwest Region Facebook group. And that's at bit.ly slash AMATIC Midwest. And you can just search for a Medic Midwest Region on Facebook and you'll see more upcoming events like this one and other helpful uh, webinars and meetups and links being shared and, and uh, a space to ask questions and, and whatnot that you can join a, a, a community of other uh, educators from the region there. So. I encourage you to do that if you haven't already. And now, as I think uh, you all probably know, Mishmatic is also a sponsor of this webinar. So I would like to turn the, the, uh, the what do you call it, not even the podium or the mic or, or the virtual uh, paddle over to Mishmatic president so that he can tell you a little bit about Mishmatic and then introduce our uh, uh, speaker formally. So take it away, Mike. We can't hear. Uh, yeah, so Mike, we cannot hear you. So you all hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So I would like to thank everyone for coming to this webinar. Um, a couple of things I'd like to share with you about Mishmatic is that our annual conference is typically in the fall, but because of the pandemic, we rescheduled it for next spring, April 9th and 10th at my home college, Lansing Community College. Um, there's a link that will be in the provided slides that will give you a link to the, to the conference website. Um, if you're not already a Mishmatic member, I would invite you and encourage you to become a member. We have both an annual membership and also we've recently established a lifetime membership option. Um, there are several ways that you can get involved with Mishmatic, involve, um, including joining a committee. If you're not a campus representative or if you don't know if your college has one, please let me know. Um, you can write an article from our newsletter that's published three times a year. And of course, you can also run for office on the executive board. And we keep fairly regular um, communication with all our members. We have a website. We also have presence on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and also LinkedIn. All right, so I'm going to, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Um, Dr. Jenna Hupp Andrews is an assistant professor of studio arts at Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan. Prior, she was lecturer two in the Department of Fine Arts and the Art History at the University of Michigan Flint and adjunct faculty at Delta College and Saginaw Valley State University, where she taught a variety of studio art, art history, visual media, and appreciation courses. She earned her master's in fine arts in sculpture from Central Michigan University and PhD in interdisciplinary studies with a concentration in humanities and society, focus, focusing on critical visual media literacy and social justice, focusing on gender, class, and race at Union Institute and University. Dr. Andrews has given several workshops on creating an inclusive classroom campus, which explores the intersectional identities of our students, especially our LG, LGBTQAI plus and disabled students. She is an active visual artist and exhibits her artwork around the state. Dr. Jenna Hupp Andrews is um, interdisciplinary artwork and research focuses on the 
social efficacies of art and how visual art media can not only engage with, but also encourage, make change in the realm of social justice. For example, the Flint water crisis, the murdering of trans women of color in our country, and children in war and poverty. Publications include engaging grotesque figurations in the college classroom, American Society for Aesthetics newsletter. Her art has been featured in the book Artist Trending Wa or Treading Water, defining the Flint water crisis through art of Gail Glover. Her focus is always on how art can inspire critical thinking and active engagement in ways that can make real change in their world. So I'm gonna turn it over to our, our speaker, Jenna. Well, that was a nice long intro. <laughs> okay, um, let's see, can I share my screen now? Let's see. Um, oh, here we go. There we go. So, um, yep, my name's Jenna. And yes, it does have two J's. Um, that's always the first question I get. Uh, let's see, I'm going to slideshow the beginning. So I'm just pulling up, um, I have, you know, of course, a presentation and it's got um, some links and a lot of information on it. And of course, this will be available to you at, at, through the recording, but also um, I always have my uh, presentations posted on my website. So, um, uh, so that links here, but you can also, um, my website is myname.net. So. Uh, let's see. Um, the way I like to do these things is um, I've, I've never been kind of a sage on the stage where I do all the talking, at least I don't like to be. So um, anytime you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, really, I think these kind of things are more useful to everyone when they're kind of driven by what you guys want to know and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm really flexible and can... Um, uh, skip around or, or whatever you need to do. So just um, feel free to ask questions anytime. Uh, so my focus, of course, is going to be on language. And really, language has power. And the language that you choose to use um, has the power to either include or exclude. And so I know a lot of times we think, well, you know, oh, oh they're just being oversensitive, or this is um, politically correct, or you're just being politically correct. It doesn't matter. Um, but really, it does, especially when it comes to people who have not historically had their identities recognized, or their um, that have been um, uh, excluded from everything. Uh, when you think about um, uh, anyone, but um, since we're focusing on the classroom and students, um, students learn best when they see images of themselves reflected in what they're learning. So if you're presenting information and you're using all your examples from um, white um, America and, you know, um, then, and you have a diverse class, they're not seeing themselves. They're not seeing themselves in your content or being able to connect very well. And then also you can get into microaggressions and such, which we'll be talking about in a, in a few. So why is inclusivity important? Um, I kind of lifted this one, uh, let's see, I lifted one of these from Penn State. <laughs> um, oh, the first one. Uh, we try to, um, uh, create learning environments where all students feel welcome and comfortable. And that we want them to participate. We want them to learn. I mean, that's why we're teaching, right? We want them to engage. We want them to learn. We want them to connect the content we're um, presenting in class to themselves to, and to be able to use it later. So if you're using language that does not connect or include everyone in your class, then you're not accomplishing your goal. Uh, also, research shows that making learning spaces accessible to non-majority students, um, nice way of saying any student that's not white <laughs> or um, disabled, uh, benefits all students by enhancing, enhancing creativity, improving problem solving and decision making skills. 
Additionally, giving students the opportunity to self-identify the names and pronouns they use in the classroom benefits all students, including international students and students who use other names that aren't like their legal name, like their middle name, or um, for instance, we have no problem calling Robert Bob, but somehow we get stuck when we're asked to call a, um, not call a transgender student by their dead name. Um, what's the difference? So, so inclusive language is language that's free from words, phrases, or tones that reflect prejudice, stereotypes, discriminatory views of particular peoples or groups. Now, hopefully, we all think we're already doing that. Um, but really, a lot of these things are uh, um, unconscious. We don't realize necessarily what we're saying or um, that, you know, um, we all have our biases. And if we're not aware of what our biases are, they slip out in our language. So we can easily um, exclude someone through a microaggression without necessarily even realizing it. So it becomes a matter of being very conscious of the words you choose and what you say and how you are calling in versus calling out. So stereotyping, of course, is something um, non um, stereotyping is something that uh, where we're making assumptions about whole groups of people or um, or about a person based on some kind of a characteristic. And again, these aren't necessarily always conscious. I hope, you know, and consciously, we, I hope most of us try to not perpetuate stereotypes. But, you know, sometimes you have maybe an unconscious bias that, you know, you see a, a student of color walk into your classroom and your first thought is, oh, they're going to be a slacker. Well, how do you know that? They may be an honor student and may be your best student, but, you know, taking, um, the appearances of, you know, maybe the way they're dressed, um, their color, their, um, their manner, their demeanor, um, you know, uh, earphones on and, and jiving to the beat. <laughs> Boy, that just showed my age. Um, you know, those things we, we take in and we form our biases and we form our kind of perception of the person from this, um, from our prior experience and through stereotypes. I mean, stereotypes are, they're, I mean, they're usually considered negative, but they're also positive. They're shortcuts. They're shortcuts for us to kind of quickly gather information that we can have until something proves it differently. So, of course, you, I mean, you may have a stereotype of um, a certain person um, that you just meet, but then in discussing to them, you realize, oh, you were totally off. That you know, had nothing like that. But your stereotype comes from your experiences uh, previous with people like that. So they're, they're shortcuts. Our mind, our minds are late. Our brains are lazy. They want shortcuts. We want to understand. We want, and, and that's how we function in the world. And I mean, we can. So, but stereotypes when they come, and they block, and they influence how your um, acting in a way that excludes people, then, then of course they're bad. Um, but we also have good stereotypes, which also are harmful. You know, like um, Asians are the um, are the uh, good immigrant because they're smart, they got degrees, and all this. Um, versus, you know, you have the bad immigrants. So, I mean, you do have good stereotypes that can injure as well. So uh, again, feel free to jump in anytime with questions. Right now, I'm just kind of going over some vocabulary and kind of uh, laying a groundwork for um, kind of what we can use and think about as we're in the classroom. Um, some of you might have heard of um, identity first versus, versus person first language. Um, and it's still, it depends on what community it, you're in. Um, um, there's still a lot of hot debate about this. It's very um, important in uh, disability communities and autistic communities. And um, there's still um, a lot of debate about it. But identity first language is where 
the disability or the disorder or the identity of the person is first and the person second. So in other words, when you're talking, you say autistic person. Um, person first language actually comes, uh, and identity first language is actually the preferred through most disability um, groups that if you talk to people with disability uh, and um, disability activists, um, autistic activists, um, very much in the autistic world, uh, identity first is preferred because they do not see autism or their disability as something that they can leave behind, that something that's not disconnected to it. It's something that defines everything that they are or affects everything they are. Person first language came out of more experts in the field, experts in disability and psychology and all this. And unfortunately, sometimes, most of the time, a lot of the time, Experts don't necessarily talk to the people that they're doing their theories and research about. So um, that came out of this per person first language came out of kind of the experts field as well as um, like parents of autistic individuals. Um, the idea is that person first, that, a, that the person is a person before their disability. So um, for example, you refer to um, he has autism, or um, uh, 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 or with autism. Um, the theory behind this is that the person is a person, no matter their disability, and that by putting them first, by putting, you know, Bob is autistic, you're seeing Bob first and the autism second. And, um, so that you're recognizing the person instead of the condition. And you know, oh, that makes sense, right? Um, the argument against that in most, um, in the autistic world, in the disability world is, um, if you need to be reminded that I'm a person, then there is an issue. <laughs> so, um, especially in the uh, world of, um, in the autism communities, Many self-advocates and allies prefer the term, terminology as autistic, autistic person, autistic individual. I've also seen autists used um, because it's inherent part of their identity. Meaning, um, <laughs> just like someone is, you know, Muslim, African American, lesbian, transgender, um, these are all part of who they are. This is their, their identity. Um, and just like, say, a, a black individual can't take off the color of their skin and leave it somewhere, autistic people cannot leave their autism somewhere. So this idea of um, he uh, with autism or such, the wording implies that it's like something like a purse that you can take off and leave somewhere and then hey now i'm, I'm not, without autism and that and that's the issue um and they're like well yeah autism is a condition but it's a condition that that is um is a neurodiversity which is um that's another term that you may have or may not have heard um neurodiverse refers to and then um uh, neurotypical. Neurotypical are those that do not have um, conditions that affect their neurology in their brain. Um, autism is a neural disorder, often comes with other neural disorders, um, comorbidities. Um, and so it affects everything. It affects who they are, how they act, how they think, how they interact. Everything about how a person is formed and becomes themselves is influenced by autism. It's not something that they can set aside and say, hey, I'm not autistic right now. So this idea of with autism or has autism really becomes um, offensive to many people who are autistic. However, if you talk to the professional fields that work with such, they're like, well, person first because they are a person. So um, applying this to a classroom, um, most of, I've had many, many autistic um, students in my class, more and more teaching in a community college. We get more and more students that even 10 years ago wouldn't even have considered going to a college. 
Um, so we get more and more people with uh, neurodiverse individuals in the class. And um, I have never had the instance where I had to say, uh, uh, refer to one of my autistic students as autistic. So, I mean, it really, unless it's pertinent, you're not going to say, oh, well, you know, autistic Bob. <laughs> so, um, so it really doesn't um, enter the classroom very well. But if you're talking to a student or talking to someone else, you don't necessarily have to or, uh, tell them that a student is autistic. Or, um, but if you do happen to be like talking to ADA or something, office or whatever, um, identity first is generally how people um, prefer. And if in question, always ask the person. Because there are still those. Oh, another thing is who really kind of push this um, person first is um, parents. And there's a lot of parents that don't want to admit that autism is so um, intertwined in their, in their child. So this idea of, you know, Bobby is Bobby. Autism is just a part of him. Um, so that was another reason it was really pushed. So I, I found the Associated Press Style Guide for how to refer to someone with um, disabilities. And um, I thought it was really interesting. And, um, and I, especially if you're, if you're teaching writing or something, this would become very relevant. The first thing I really thought was great was re only refer to a disability when it's relevant to the story. So, um, like I, I was reading an um, example where they're like, if the story is about the sound of a train, then it really doesn't matter if the per this person you're interviewing is in a wheelchair because being in the wheelchair does not affect how they're hearing the sound of the train. So, you know, if it's not relevant to the story, don't, don't mention it. Of course, we have the sensationalists and then, um, you know, uh, press and such, and we see how many stories a day where, um, if the if it's about someone with a disability, that's right splashed right across the headline to get people to look at the story. But um, it really does make sense. Um, this I thought was kind of disappointing. <laughs> when possible, use people first language unless otherwise indicated by the source. So uh, unfortunately, they default to people first language, which is understandable since that's what the experts prefer. Um, but it's really disappointing when actually the community that they're talking about um, overwhelmingly prefers identity first. Um, not to say that there aren't those that still do like person first. Um, always ask the source how you would like to be described. And I mean, this is definitely applicable to our classrooms too. It's like, um, if it's pertinent, ask the student. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. So, um, oh, and never, ever, ever use the new words like um, differently abled. Handicappable is one I've never heard before, but that's horrible. Um, diversability. <laughs> Don't use those. Um, disability is not a bad word. Um, and there's so many disability activists that are trying to ingrain in people that disability is not a bad word. That's what they are. They have a disability. And most of them are, um, a lot of people subscribe to the idea, a social definition of disability, which means that if they had the correct accommodations, then they would, in society, they wouldn't necessarily be disabled, that they're actually disabled by the, um, the situation and the way society is structured. So if there was the accommodations of usable ramps and wide aisles and everything in every store and every um, uh, business establishment, then a person in a wheelchair would not necessarily be disabled because they have access and are able to access everything without any problem. Um, but even having one step, then all of a sudden they're disabled because they can't get up that step. So the social definition of disability is actually puts more of the onus on society than on the actual person because they would not necessarily be disabled or not able to do things if they had the accommodations they needed. So don't go with the, don't try to find the euphemisms. That's horrible, it's horrible. Um, <laughs> and it sounds so horrible. Um, just use the word disabled. It's not a bad word. So um, 
I always, <laughs> when I do these, I, lo I love finding, uh, Sophie LaBelle is the one that does these, um, these comics, and she's an amazing transgender artist. And um, she, her social commentary and how um, LGBTQ um, people exist in the world and, and such, are just amazing. But I thought this one was perfect for microaggressions. Um, we had her come to campus um, uh, a couple years ago and talk, and she's just an amazing person. But microaggressions, everyday, or everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, snubs, insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to a target person. Um, or based solely upon their marginalized group membership. And microaggressions, they may not seem necessarily um, important or really a big deal, but they are. So I, I'm gonna go into a little bit about the identity of who um, LGBTQAI populations are. Um, you can kind of read this as I'm, I'm talking. But um, uh, race, uh, sexuality, gender, um, disability, these are all identities that are often um, the target of microaggressions, whether and um, whether we know we're doing it or we don't. Um, if you refuse to use the person's name that they ask you to use, if you refuse, if you continually misgender someone, even though you know um, what gender they are, um, those are microaggressions. Um, and they, and you know, little things, <laughs> I had, I had, years ago, I had a colleague, um, black woman, she taught English, uh, we were both adjuncts at Delta, and um, the English and the, uh, the humanities all shared an office, so I, I talked a lot with the English people. And um, she was telling me about in her grad program, she was often um, one of the only black people in the room. And which, being that she went to U of M Flint, you would think would be kind of surprising, but it, 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 it isn't, unfortunately. Um, and she was in one class where the professor, happened to be a white woman, um, they were talking about language, and she turned to my friend, my colleague, and said, do they still say that? And she's like, uh, what? <laughs> it's like, well, let me speak for all my people. And, um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, it, assuming that, you know, she can speak for every person who's black. Um, she was also, uh, one that, you know, in a lot of, especially, uh, uh, people of color in higher education, um, will often get, you're so articulate. Well, yeah, we think that's a compliment, but it's also a microaggression and an insult because we assume, because they're people of color, that they are not going to be articulate. So when they are, it surprises us. But do you ever tell a, a white speaker how articulate they are? That doesn't happen very often. So, um, so you know, a lot of times it's good intentions, like, oh, we think it's a compliment, but it's coming from stereotypes. So we really have to kind of think about what we're saying and how we're saying it. Um, so you can see a lot of the statistics here. I know um, the alphabet keeps getting longer and longer. So for those of you who aren't familiar, we got the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, the Q is queer. Um, A is asexual and I is intersexual, intersexual or intersex. Um, and then the plus includes some minority um, names that go off like um, Two Spirit and things like that. So um, um, some, there is some people, uh, usually allies, that are trying to make the A all about allies, but why do allies have to center themselves also within this? <laughs> so allies, um, it is asexual. Uh, versus allies. I know some people also um, have trouble with the intersex being included in the alphabet here um, because it's actually a medical to condition versus, um, you know, like that's different than everything else. 
but um but yeah um so one thing to keep in mind when you're when you're dealing with lgbtqai students um they have a higher risk um of health and mental um health issues um and this isn't because of their makeup or anything this is because years of microaggressions and years of outright discriminations um going to doctors that don't believe them or treat them differently i mean um we have the same issue with people in poverty overweight um people who are overweight doctors always blame everything on their weight not on what it could be i actually have a friend who had a cancerous tumor the size of a fetus because they were blaming it all along on her weight <laughs> and they didn't bother to look for it so there's a lot of um, things that go on with the medical field there. Um, and you see kind of the breakdown of the LGBT population. Um, 13 to 17 year old, biggest problem, 26 say not feeling accepted, um, uh, school bullying and fear of being outed. Um, 92% say they hear negative messages from internet, peers, etc. Um, transgender individuals, 3% um, of students age 25 and younger are transgender. And transgender is a really kind of a um, overall term. It does include um, some other things under it. 5% um, of the po US population Again, they have a higher risk of health and mental issues, um, greater risk of bullying, 43% suicide attempt rate, uh, attempt rate. That is unacceptable. <laughs> um, at college age, when you're looking at the general college age from 18 to like 30, 49% um, suicide attempt rate. Um, number one way that they have found that percent that prevents um, suicide and suicide attempts with transgender individuals and really with uh, any of the LGBTQAI um, is acceptance. From parents. Sorry, my dog. Um, acceptance from parents. If the parents accept the person um, as transgender, as their their gender, their true gender. Um, there is, the percentage of suicide um, attempts go way down. It's like the number one thing. Number two, um, the num the second um, the second uh, best thing to <laughs> present prevent suicide is in absence of a parent's approval. And believe me, most of my transgender students, I just want to slap the parents. Um, in absence of a supportive parent one person who accepts them for whom they are and um, supports them and is there for them can reduce that suicide rate. So I always um, add in here, be that person. It's that simple. You know, you can be that, you may not even realize it, but you may be that one person that keeps them from doing something so serious as suicide. Um, one thing to consider too, there's a high co-occurrence of autism in transgender individuals which also leads to a connection in genetics and, and neurology, um, that it's something like 20% or right around 20% of transgender individuals are also artistic. Art yes, artistic, um, but also autistic. Um, <laughs> I say that I teach in the art department and we have a lot of uh, uh, trans students there, so. Um, so I think the best way, I love this video, it's one of the best videos that, um, that was made. Um, these are students from their own perspective uh, talking about basically um, it all boils down to language. So. Can you all hear that? No? No? Yeah, no. Bugger. Can't hear it. No, we don't hear it. Bugger. Okay. I wonder whether there's a... John, is there a way to share sound? Oh, boy. Uh... If not, watch the video when you can. <laughs> yeah, I'll put the link in the 
chat. I okay. think that I think the issue is that you have to share the system's sound at the beginning of the screen share. Oh, okay. Um, okay, let me how do how do I get back out of yeah, it? Probably yeah, you need to change the audio to the same as the system. Yeah. We've had this problem too, Jenna, with the Zoom meetings that I've had where if they're trying to play a video, you just can't hear the sound at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I was afraid of that. Oh well. Yeah, um, yeah so but how... if, if you stop sharing the screen and then when you go to reshare at the bottom of the the uh yep. that box should be a little check box that you check share system sound. Advanced options. Or share computer sound, like it's uh, right in the bottom left of the uh, the share screen. Okay. Oh, share computer sound. Cool. Yes. Yes, you found it. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, nervous and worried about professors misgendering me or using my legal name in the classroom. And it kind of brought me to a place where I didn't want to speak up and I didn't want to be open anymore. To unpack. I identify as gender fluid. Queer or pansexual. Queer trans man who is also Christian identified and white. I identify as a dom or masculine of centered. A trans male. Pronouns are she, her, or kid, at which I made that up with two Ds. I've chosen masculine for the time being. I'm trying it out. Poly, pansexual, transsexual, gender fluid. I prefer they, them, their pronouns. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am gender fluid. I identify as a queer, genderqueer, or non-binary trans person. Her, her, and hers. They, them, and theirs. I'm genderqueer, uh, pansexual. It's pansexual, and I am also a trans man. A lesbian. A gay man. And I am a non-binary trans woman of color. FTM, so I do identify as male, but I am transgender. And then I am also asexual, probably aromantic on that scale. Preferred gender pronouns are a big thing. We are constantly worrying about being outed in classrooms, in, um, in counselors' offices. Our school isn't set up so that we have preferred names or preferred pronouns on a roster that a professor gets. So what do you prefer to be called or what are you, what if you're masculine of center presenting, do you identify as trans or lesbian? Do you have a preferred gender pronoun? Uh, getting your legal name changed is really hard or uh, expensive to do and it's really out of my budget. If someone who's trans doesn't email the professor beforehand, and say, hey, I know this is what it's what it says on your roster, but actually I prefer this. And so you're essentially coming out every semester. Before I had my legal name change was that before all the classes, I would end up emailing my professors and being like, can you call me this name? Can you use these pronouns? And if you don't email them beforehand, you have a really awkward situation on your hands when they call roll. Every day it's it's scary to just be in class not knowing what people are going to say. When my professors don't notice that I have a preferred name listed in the university registry, um, it can be very anxiety inducing to wonder, oh, what's going to happen on that first day of class when I'm outed? What are other students going to say? What are what are, What is the teacher going to say? People need to know that if they sign up for certain gym classes that they will be able to go into the space, it's best for them and they need a system where people can get preferred names on their ID cards and being able to go into a classroom the first day knowing that your birth name will not be spoken. My school does not have a preferred name policy, um, so a lot of times I feel uncomfortable talking to teachers or other students um, or even submitting assignments because it's not the name that I identify with. And some of them respected that and some of them didn't. And the ones who didn't, I immediately just totally checked out of their classes and just sort of did the bare minimum to pass. There have been classes that I've skipped intentionally because I don't feel safe going. 
there have been times where I've offered, um, I guess, as a sort of different perspective on, you know, normal gender role ideas and, you know, that kind of thing, and it was kind of met with big backlash. Advisors sort of tried to make a safe space, but at the same time, I don't feel comfortable and supported to be myself in those situations. So sometimes when we're dealing with sensitive issues, I have kind of trouble. A teacher misgendering me, like, oh, good morning, sir, or, you know, um, students passing me, what's up, man, things of that nature. Um, before I came out as gender fluid, completely misgendered. But when I encompassed the gender fluid, it made it easier for me. So I felt, felt like I kind of like recoiled and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't thrive or I couldn't be as successful in that environment as I wanted to be. There are instances where I feel unsafe, uh, mostly because they're unmonitored or it's just not very populated. Um, and I feel that there is an easy chance for me to be targeted as a trans person. If it's just a simple thing about using the women's bathroom. One of our students is a trans female, and she actually was escorted out of one of our bathrooms by a security guard. As soon as I walk in there, I get stares, uh, and it's hard for me to um, stare off those stares and, you know, counteract anything that they say or that they do. So constantly at school, I am forced to think about the necessities of my own well-being versus um, thinking about my classroom and what I should be studying. Anybody on the scale of fluidity with their gender, they need to be able to go into the bathroom that they're most comfortable with and no one should be able to be harassed or removed by security. I've lived in all women's dorms and being the only guy in a women's dorm is kind of awkward. I'm fortunate enough to be able to switch it on and off in a way that um, I can dress the way I want in safe places and then dress how I need to when I can. When I am trying to concentrate in class, but I'm trying to also map out how I can get to the restroom while being safe. There should be family bathrooms for anyone to be able to use the bathroom. We're just going to the bathroom, you know? that needs to go into my campus. Um, a lot of more acceptance. Housing has not made much progress. Um, I've created an entire proposal. Always feel uncomfortable in spaces where people start mentioning video. how they okay. date and they have sex. Not because they're being, you know, prejudiced against me, but because it's something I don't understand. I'm gonna stop it there. Um, especially the first part is really, um, let's see, so how? How do I get out of this now? Uh, back? Ah, there we go. Um, but you notice how um, so many of them were saying how unsafe they feel, or if they're not respected or referred to as their name or their um, pronouns. All right. OK, there's like a video going on in my background, apparently. Um, I probably record this video stop 15 to 20 times every day struggle and, and thank you this stop one and stop okay there we go okay cool but anyways um do you really want your students to check out I mean, you saw you know, it's like soon as, as soon as they refuse to use it or they don't use my correct pronouns, um, I check out. I don't do the class. I don't show up. Um, I, those are um, may not seem like a big deal to you, but in people whose identities have never been or not been um, recognized for their life time, that's huge. So, and it doesn't take a lot. I mean, we call. Uh, Elizabeth Becky if she wants to so you know why can we can't we use their their actual name and not their dead name um, they frequently uh, have ver um, experienced verbal harassment I've had I've had colleagues I've heard of colleagues that um, absolutely refuse to use 
their, um, their chosen name. Luckily in our school, we do have um, the system now where um, their preferred name is on the roster. However, um, I also have a trans student who cannot um, change their name in, um, in the system uh, because his, their father often goes into their um, information and their websites and such. And whereas his, their father knows, he's not really that supportive. So he, they go by a name um, that is not their legal name. So, um, so even if you have the system, there's instances where that doesn't, um, that doesn't come into play. Um, so things you can do. And um, these really go across LGBT students. Um, you know, know what your, uh, does your school offer programs? Um, are, is there things that are there for your students, whether LGBTQ, um, different nationalities, races, international students, disability? Um, you know, yes, we all have ADA on our campuses, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's well enforced. Um, so inclusive. Um, when you go to call roll, if you call roll at the, like the beginning of the first day, call by the last names, not by the first names. Really simple change. And then you go by their last name and ask them to say the name that they want to be uh, called by. Real simple and you're not outing anyone. Um, or what I often do is I actually go around and have them introduce themselves. Is that introduce yourself with the name that you, want, that you use and there's no issue and I'm not outing anyone. Um, Model desired behavior. You know, again, um, the way you act will influence how your class, how your students um, interact. Um, adopt inclusive language. Um, pronouns, use correct pronouns, and they as a um, gender neutral. I know a lot of us have problems with that. I still have problems with that. I don't have pro philosophical problems with it, but I have brain to mouth problems with that, <laughs> right? Um, I've had, I have some transgender students that I knew before they transitioned. And I've been called out on using the wrong pronoun. Um, I know their pronoun. I have no problem with their name. Um, but for some reason, that connection between my brain and my mouth says one thing when I'm thinking another. So it's, it takes practice. It takes being conscious of what you're saying. Um, and don't be afraid, if you're called out or if you misgender someone, don't go into a huge, oh, I'm so sorry, I said, apologize, move on. Um, what I hate is when they respond, oh, I'm used to it. I'm like, oh, no, you shouldn't be used to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, I've been also a good, uh, this is something I'm still working on, is if you default to they. Um, I know it's hard because you know a lot of us were brought up saying you know they is not a singular pronoun, even though it's been a singular pronoun since the 13th century. Um, if you default to they until some until they tell you you know what their pronoun is, then then you're not misgendering them. I actually introduce myself now with my pronouns, and I say um, she, her, hers, they, them, and I I go by any of them. And that's actually one way that um, I see as normalizing the singular they, um, that I can, like that small little thing. Edu educate yourself on the issues faced by your um, people of color or students of color, disabled, international students, uh, LGBTQ, um, what their problems are on campus, alpha campus, advocate for them with your, um, uh, with your administration using, think about when you, what kind of examples you're using. So um, not everyone in your class is necessarily American. So if you're like an as, as American as apple pie or you're referring to something that's very American centric, they may not understand. So think about what kind of idioms you're using. Avoid binaries, um, gender neutral phrases. Do not assume someone's gender on their name alone or their looks. 
Um, look for ways to, again, you know that idea of, you know, people need to see themselves in media, they need to see themselves in society to be feel part of it, they need to see themselves in your classroom. So look for ways to include uh, examples, assessments, written consent, using people with disability as um, in your examples, or ethnic or gender neutral names. Um, don't make them all John and Sally. Um, Use world problems, not just you know um, white problems. Um, don't don't use differently abled. That's another one. Um, I pulled this from somewhere else. Uh, I linked this at the end. Um, don't use differently abled. That's another one of those euphemisms. Um, use current events and historical examples. Um, I guess I'm reinforcing this. Don't use differently abled. Um, be a word. Be aware of the words that you use and how they may alienate or misrepresent. If you're using um, a person of color in your example, um, for or in your story problem or whatever, make sure you're not using them stereotypically. You know, you know, like the um, the smart Asian Asian student that's really good at math. Um, you know, um, make sure you're not using stereotypes in there. Really, uh, and look for um, sources that are um, intersectional. Intersectional means going across identities because we're not. I'm not just a white person, I'm not just a woman. I have all these other identities that intersect and affect how I'm treated. Everyone has these intersecting communities. A person who's transgender is not just transgender. They're also their um, ethnicity, they're also their race. They're also, um, there's all these things that intersect to create the person that they are. Um, there's certain things too, like in the deaf community and in the blind community, um, I see like this source like to say use visually impaired not blind. Well, it depends. I know a lot of people who um, are in the blind community call themselves blind. Um, some use visually impaired. Same with hearing. I have a friend who was just diagnosed hearing impaired. She's comfortable with that term. Um, hard of hearing or deaf are two very common ways of describing in the deaf community. Again, just like disability, deaf is not a bad word. Neither is blind. So don't find, don't find euphemisms. Um, think about, you know, holidays. Um, this came up in the last time I did this, this presentation. Um, people of color versus, or black people instead of um, African American. Um, a lot, um, African American is something that they're kind of moving away from simply because you know just because you're black doesn't mean your ancestors come from uh, are African. I have a lot of friends who are Caribbean, um, so uh, people of color or BL uh, black people of color. Oh, that's a typo. It should be POC. Um, those are um, or black is what's more uh, generally um, wanted. So. Any kind of questions? It's um, oh, this is an example of my syllabus. I have a page that's class values, and um, I mentioned my pronouns. I'm cis. Cis is not a bad word either. Um, cis just means that I identify with the gender I was assigned at birth. Um, in science, cis is the opposite of trans. It's not an insult. Um, so I say my pronouns, and I've had more students thank me for that. I don't make them say theirs, though. I tell them to come up and talk to me, um, and that's why I try to uh, default to they. And then um, down here, um, you know, I don't allow any kind of um, discrimination in my class. So this is right, my values are right in the syllabus. So I know, I know, I, know I did a lot of talking. So, um, questions? <laughs> I did not see your syllabus. Oh, I'll have this posted too, but I can bring it back up. Yeah, this is just, um, this is a page that I do my class values. Oh, okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. 
One of the and, classes that I took was a sign language class years ago. And one of the things that the teacher reminded us of is, you know, make sure you're actually pronouncing the word deaf with an F on the end, because <laughs> <laughs> many of them can read lips and they will hear, they will see you say the word death with a TH. Um, so, you know, just things like that, you wouldn't mm -hmm. even think of it. You just trip over your words and say the wrong word. That would be very offensive to them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um. Yeah, and uh, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, I see a lot, a lot of people in the blind community. Not Most people who are blind are not necessarily totally blind. They have some residual sight. They can have peripheral sight. They can see colors and shapes. A lot of them use their phone and can read and have huge text on the phone and can use the apps in that way. So, and so they're carrying a white cane and looking at their phone and I've seen more pictures on social media of making fun of them. It's like, oh yeah, they're deaf. I mean, they're, they're blind. Well, yes, they are, <laughs> but the phone is also a tool. So don't, yeah, don't, or just like everyone who uses a wheelchair is not non-ambulatory. So if you see someone get out of their wheelchair in a store or get, um, you know, get a wheelchair out of their car and then sit, that wheelchair is a is is a tool that they need. So um, again, our stereotypes. <laughs> so other questions. Language. Language is fun. Oh uh, well, uh, I was reminded by the Mishmatic president in the in the chat room that uh, as as a a colorblind person i oh yeah I, I sometimes like if somebody says like look at the blue link like mm -hmm. it, especially as we're we're thinking about the remote classroom and designing what our class will look like online uh, there needs to also be that sort of realization that uh, something is the important part is highlighted in yellow or whatever mm -hmm. it might be might not be uh, inclusive to somebody with a, a color uh, mm -hmm. disability. And so I, I feel like even colors can be mm -hmm. something where uh, just making sure that if you are going to use a color or color code something, you, you use like a, also a shape because I, I did have a instructor in college where he had two versions of each quiz, one on a yellow paper and one on a blue paper, but at the top of the yellow papers, he always put a, I think it was a, a circle, and then the top of the blue one's a, a triangle. So there are just certain things where, um, you know, it made it easier for me as somebody who's colorblind to go and turn in my paper in the correct pile. So. Mm -hmm. Um, th there's lots I, of things that we can think about like that. Yeah, I think of you often, John, <laughs> when I'm when I'm um, doing my online class, because I used to use a lot of col uh, I would use color to emphasize, and um, I I was in a session at a conference um, last year on um, on online accessibility, and one of them was that specifically do not use color to emphasize, and. Um, I always think I, I think of you often because you're profoundly colorblind, right? You don't see color. Uh, I see I see some color, but yeah, the yeah. the blues and the pinks and the brown and the reds and the green and the yeah. yellows and the purples and the blues. They sometimes they blend together. They, and I've had I've had colorblind art students, and which is really fun to teach color theory, but I've gotten some of the best color projects from colorblind students. It's funny. It's great. I love it. But um, but no, that's definitely not an online that, that becomes very important. So uh, now what I do is if I do use like a highlight color, which will kind of come off like if you do, if you, I try not to use red and green since that's the common colorblindness. So I don't use those colors. Um, but if I do use like a highlight color, I make sure the words are bolded too so that you have those two forms of being emphasized. I also, um, if it's like a, um, something really important, I'll make the letters bigger. Um, and online there's a lot of things, and so the written language too, 
um, how you format it, um, the um, the, the um, font you use is very important. Um, for dyslexia, um, there's a dyslexia font, but it looks a lot like Comic Sans, and Comic Sans is also really good for dyslexia. However, I would be drummed out of my art department if I used Comic Sans for my syllabus. I would, they would just like fire me right there, walk me out. Um, so I use um, Arial, which is a, um, a Sans um, font. So any of the font, uh, Courier and uh, um, Arial are kind of second, are, are, are good for um, dyslexia. Um, as long as, you know, they don't have those little, little hoops and, and stuff on a uh, Sans, a uh, Sans Serif. Um, so you want a Sans Serif font. Um, so yeah, things like that we don't necessarily think about on an online setting. You know, someone who has difficulty reading. My gla I need new glasses, so I'm having so much trouble reading online lately. Um, and so some fonts blend together. I make some fonts bigger so I can see. Um, so I mean, it's really kind of bringing to light some of those issues that you deal with with online. Um, I also get a headache really bad lately because of my glasses combined with online. So um, when you're, my syllabus, I did redesigned several years ago to be accessible. Um, I did a lot of research like in font and things like that. My, my syllabus is like 24 pages long, but it's because I break it up with images. It's because I break up the text into shorter passages. It's because my text is larger. I, it's double spaced. These are all things that are accessibility issues. So um, that we don't necessarily think about. But color is a great one. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, yeah, and I only did because of the Mishmatic president here reminded me of it. But I know that we are ending the hour here, mm -hmm. but if anyone has one or two last quick questions, I'm sure that there's a minute for that. Yeah, I, I'm fine. If you need to leave, that's fine too. But if you want to ask some questions, I'm sorry I went over. Um, I wanted more, I get going. <laughs> I wanted more interaction. Um, fill out a short form. A lot of people do that, fill out a short form, um, which is a good way too, because then you have it in writing and you can kind of remember who, what, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so there there were some ideas in the, the chat that were uh, thrown out there, such as um, having a form in advance of the class or on mm -hmm. the day of class or having students introduce themselves or- Yeah, index card, or, yeah. Uh, and I, I actually uh, send an email before the class begins, like a couple of mm -hmm. days before, and I've had students respond back, like, thank you for asking in advance. Uh, because we, some of us teach at colleges where uh, the college does take a college-wide approach to allowing students to give their preferred name or, or whatever it might be that would help students be more comfortable, but uh, my college doesn't I uh, have that, but I, mm -hmm. I in our uh, learning management system, uh, but uh, there are ways for a, a student to go and uh, request that their name, their display name be changed, but they have to do that. And so sometimes if, if uh, I don't at least tell them in advance, then they get to the uh, first day of, of, uh, an online class especially and because that's totally different even than an in-person class where they can say verbally who they are to the rest of the class or, mm -hmm. or their name is next to all their discussion posts or in the roster online that other students can see and so yeah. it, it definitely is a little bit trickier in online environment it is sometimes because then also you um i mean we all form you know, like uh, you know like i said you know stereotypes or quick assessments um we look at a name and they're we're like okay that's a male student i went through a whole semester thinking one student was male and ended up female because they had one of the names that was normally a male name but it was female name um so i mean you can't assume from names 
um, I do ask at the beginning of um, an online class, you know, um, to share their um, uh, pronouns in the intro. But a lot of students still aren't real under, if you're not in like um, LGBT community or, or such, that some students aren't even like, what do you mean share pronouns? Um, but uh, it is it is harder online because you're not seeing them. But then, you know, um, seeing them is a whole other element too. Um, and I know before we had the system where you could change, they could change their names. Um, you You can't change your name in the LMS. It's your legal name. So then you're trying, is that, well, no, I, I go by Bob. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not Becky. Um, but you have to see, continuously see your dead name. Um, I had a student that refused, well, they graduated now, he graduated now, but um, he so hated checking his email because for some reason, they his name was changed everywhere else but his email. So. Every time his email came, he saw his dead name. And it just like continuously graded on him so that um, I, I used his other email when I could. Um, do you require students to show their face in Zoom environments? Um, no. I hate being videoed. I'm getting better at it. <laughs> but um, no, I don't. Um, for a lot of reasons. For one, technology. Um, I mean, I teach in Flint. So I have a lot of students that don't have great technology. Um, their bandwidth may not be able to handle participating in the Zoom and showing their video. So I mean, just thinking from that point of view, no, so I don't. Um, but then there's also those that don't feel comfortable. Um, I had an autistic student last semester and um, they, uh, also had, had anxiety, anxiety um, um, and they were, they could communicate so much better with me through text than um, like face to face. Um, so in the classroom, of course, I would check in with her and, and things, um, but I would often um, kind of keep watch on what she was doing um, from a distance so that she had that space and, and such. Um, and, but most of the time, if she had any questions, she would text them to me. Works for me. Um, it was kind of interesting because she reminded me so much of my daughter. Um, she had a hard time, then had that um, kind of selective mutism where you go to um, talk or ask a question and the anxiety just like cuts it off and you can't or you stutter, things like that. So um, texting was a way that she could communicate better. Um, so when we moved online, she would come to all the Zoom classes that uh, um, demonstrations and talks that I would do, um, but she would never put the video on and I would never make her do it. Um, yeah, that's just one way to really exacerbate someone with an anxiety disorder um, and, and someone who's autistic. So. So yeah, um, yeah, it's nice to see um, the faces of your students. And you know, there's always the students that you know, might not be listening, but that, that shows up in other ways. If they're not listening, they're taking it on themselves. So why should I police them? It's their decision as adults. Um, let's see. Oh, can you share my um, slides? Yeah, I have no problem with it. Um, I have all the sources I use cited on the slides because it's not all necessarily my words. Um, but yeah, uh, just to attribute it. Um, you can always share, share it from the link. I, um, um, I'll have John, I'll get John the link and have him send it out. I'll have it housed on my website. Yep, that, that works for me. I have the list of everyone who signed up. That, that's sort of why I had the registration page so that we could follow up with everyone uh, properly. Yeah. And um, I, I think that, you know, you make a good point about the, the video because I saw the one news story where all the students changed their names to reconnecting. And so the <laughs> uh, in, instructor didn't, didn't know what was going on. Yeah. But, I, th there's always that character in the mm. crowd. And really, you know, 
there's always going to be those students. And if the students aren't there listening, then it's going to be on them, right? So, I mean, it's going to show up in their work. It's going to show up in whatever. Um, of course, often they also become the ones that are the pain in the butt and challenge the grades, but you know, <laughs> it's our life. Um, uh, last semester, when we switched to online halfway through, mm -hmm. uh, about half the students did not log into my um, Zoom sessions, lectures. Mm -hmm. And I was nervous, but when the first test came out, and I looked at the grades, the ones that were doing okay, I didn't say anything to, in fact, the only ones I made, I especially reached out to were the ones that missed the first test and I wanted to find out why. Mm -hmm. One goes, oh, I should have let you know I dropped. Oh Another one had had work rearranged and was working during the lecture time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he said, I don't want to drop. But I'm not sure what to do. And I said, let me know what you need. I will work with you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to make any special accommodations, just the words, I will work with you. It's amazing what that will do. Yeah. <clears throat> and the other one thought he dropped the patent. <laughs> <laughs> There's always those. Um, but yeah, I, I always recorded my Zooms too, because I would uh, usually only, I would use them to um, answer questions, of course, but also to introduce a project. And so I would record them. So if they couldn't be there, that they could come back and watch it. So they also had, they had me talking about it um, on the Zoom, but then they also had the paperwork and the examples and all that. They had different venues to look at the, the assignment. But yeah, that's the nice thing about Zoom is you can record it. So if they couldn't see it, then record it and post it and they can watch it later. And I have one student that was very upset when we went to online because she had tried, I teach statistics, she'd taken a statistics course online previously and dropped it very quickly because it wasn't working out for her. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the semester, she said the difference between what I did and the previous one was I did my best to make it interactive. Mm -hmm. Encourage questions. I give extra credit if you ask a question in class. Oh, I like that. <laughs> and if I ask a question and you answer it, you get extra credit, even if you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing what a couple points will do, too. It's like in the bigger scheme of things, half the time it doesn't really affect their grade much. Yeah. You know, do things for it. <laughs> well, what I find is the interaction with them helps me teach better. Mm -hmm. I tell them, okay, statistics is intuitive for me. For me. That's good and that's bad. Mm -hmm. It's good because I know the stuff and I can explain it well. It's bad because I don't know what's hard for you to understand. Exactly. <laughs> and you have, and I specifically say this, you have to tell me what you don't understand so I can explain it better. Yeah. Um, I tell them that the, my job is to teach them statistics and theirs is to meet me halfway. <laughs> yeah, and like with, um, with teaching foundational art, a lot of it is learning vocabulary, but it's also learning vocabulary for kind of what we do intuitively. Like we're always interpreting visuals. <laughs> now I'm giving you the language to understand it. So a lot of times too, I'm like, if I'm saying something, you, a word that you don't understand, I. I, you know, catch me on it because I don't, it, I've been doing it for so long, I don't realize that it's a jargon word, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but that, that's all, I'm glad you brought up with um, online classes. That's the thing, there's so, there's so much misunderstanding among faculty. You know, online, where you just post up all the stuff and maybe do a discussion question and that's it. Well, no, you need that. Students will engage in your class online if you are engaged with them. And I teach mine very discussion board heavy because I, I totally believe that you can't understand art in isolation, that you need to talk about it and see other people's point of view. And if they're only getting my point of view and the book's point of view, what's the point? <laughs> so I'm, I'm constantly in the discussion board adding to the discussions and students are discussing and they're seeing everyone's point of view and not just mine. So you have to engage. Yeah. That one of the things I learned to do in the classroom was try and end my lecture 
about 20 minutes or so before the end of the lunch, and then hand, break the class into groups and have them work in groups. Mm -hmm. And then they would sit there and talk to each other. And I haven't figured out how to get that same eyeball to eyeball interaction in mm -hmm. uh, Zoom. Because it, you can scroll an equation down or do a sketch mm -hmm. on paper very easily if you're in a group. I don't know how to do that mm -hmm. online. Yeah, there are some um, you know, technology things. We actually, they just got one of those clear boards where you write on it and the, the camera automatically flips it so that they're looking at, you're behind and they're seeing it right, the right way, not opposite. It, really weird stuff. I haven't used it yet, but it's kind of cool. Um, but uh, I've yeah. been uh, I've been known to sit there and sketch something out on a piece of paper and then hold it up to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, when, when somebody was asking, uh, stayed on afterwards and said, can I ask you a few questions? And he was struggling with something. And I finally realized the picture was the best way to show it to him. And mm -hmm. that's what I did. And he laughed. Mm -hmm. He said, that makes it clear. Exactly. You have to We're use visual. your imagination. We're visual. We're visual people. Yeah. I mean, humans are visual. We interpret things constantly visually. So uh, seeing it from a different way instead of, that, that totally makes sense. Yep. I, well, I well, feel like um, for the most part, like I, I do want to wrap up now, but, mm -hmm. uh, I, but I, I think that uh, I'll make sure that everyone gets the recording and the, um, the, the PowerPoint. And Jenna, I think your contact information probably on the, PowerPoint or somewhere yeah, on your website if anyone wants to ask for clarification mm -hmm. or share any like uh, success stories maybe of things that they mm -hmm. they changed because of uh, hearing this webinar and I mean there's always things that mm -hmm. anyone can do to be more inclusive of, of everyone in their classes like yeah. even like uh, as we've been moving to remote learning or online learning I've even thought to myself like there might be a student with a wrist injury or a carpal <laughs> tunnel or something like that that might require them a little bit longer to type a response to something and so I, I try to be even aware of those types of, mm -hmm. of things so yeah and feel free, free feel free to drop me an email or, or whatever um, I'm more than happy to answer questions um, or just you know talk or brainstorm ideas um, the one thing I didn't mention too is never put it on your student to educate your to educate you. You know, come to someone like me. Come to a department on your campus or, or expert on your campus or something. Don't ask you know. Don't ask your black student to educate you on racism. <laughs> don't ask your disabled student to educate <laughs> you on their disability. Um, really, you don't need to know about their disability unless it interacts with what they're after doing in class. Um, so yeah, don't never put it on a student to explain, you know, asking your transgender student to explain their sexuality. I mean, really, uh, it's <laughs> always <laughs> come to someone else, you know, they, they're asked so much. If they're willing to share and help, that's great. And that's giving and that's a lot of energy. That's that, um, oh, geez, what's, there's a term for it now. Um, uh, emotional, um, Oh, geez, I can't remember the word where um, you're asked to do the emotional work or to explain things and such. Um, no, come to someone else. Always, I'm always open. 